thank you for this great honor. It's really, um, it's, it's an honor, a pleasure. It feels like a homecoming for me to, to see so many faces that I've seen over the years and be with family, um, uh, friends, and to meet new, new members of the family who are here today as well. Uh, this is particularly meaningful for me uh, because it's Baltimore, and this is where I went to school. And uh, the last time I attended clinic, last time I saw patients in Baltimore was about 45 years ago when I was in medical school. And then I was learning from my teachers. Uh, now I'm learning more from my students. So, uh, but, but thank you for this great opportunity. And, uh, and, and, and thank you, Michelle. I also, I'm, I'm very pleased. I know Eileen and Mona are also very pleased to finally see this. Um, uh, see this report published. Uh, we worked very hard on it last winter. We're very glad that it's finally published. A lot of work went into it, and so now it's it's there for you. Uh, the uh, the uh, annual report, the new annual report. I think we'll get ready to start writing the new one uh, right after the new year. So there's a lot of new things. I also want to say, also want to say that in this report, you'll hear about you'll read about the International Clinical Council on FOP which is fairly new. It's on page, I think, 58 or something. And you'll read about the International Clinical Council, which is a group of clinicians from around the world who take care of patients with FOP. And there's been a beautiful paper published by Ed, Ed's committee, in, that, uh, in our council about clinical trials. And uh, I'm very proud to, to tell you that within the next two months, you'll see the updated version of the uh, treatment guidelines that you've all been waiting for. Um, there's not been a major uh, uh, addition to the clinical guidelines since 2011, and we've spent an entire year working on this, and you'll have that, those clinical guidelines. There are 14 new sections. It'll be a very usable set of guidelines, and I think uh, from what I've heard from others around the world that it's a uh, highly anticipated and widely used. So. Uh, anticipate in the new year that that will become available. The topic for my uh, talk this morning is the MAPS, TAPS, and FAPS of FOP, and, uh, or FOP. And um, I'd like to give you some idea in the time I have about, the, about where we've been, about where we are, where we are now, and where we're going with, uh, with, with research, not just at Penn, but all around the world. It's a very exciting time, as you've heard uh, last night and this morning from, from the speakers already, from the pharmaceutical companies. When Eileen and I started our work on FOP back in 1991, and even before that, in 1988, uh, when we were dabbling in that, uh, we decided, and it was very easy to decide, that the mission was to determine the cause of FOP at a molecular, genetic, cellular, physiologic level, and use that information to design better treatments and targeted treatments to uh, eventually cure FOP. That is still a mission, and that's still a mission of everybody in the research community and the pharmaceutical community around the world. Last year, Carolyn Pissonnier from France wrote a book, and you see the cover of that book and two pictures from that book. and. Um, in there, I think she epitomized, she tells the story of a little princess who has FOP and her brother is trying to help. But in that book, she has a picture of the clinician seeing the patients with FOP. We learn from you. And we take those lessons back to the laboratory and we um, uh, uh, try to uh, introduce them uh, into, uh, into a framework that'll be useful for clinical treatments. And that's been carried out by, also by the pharmaceutical companies as partners in this, in this endeavor. This is a picture from an article in Atlantic Monthly, and it shows uh, uh, how we uh, try, try to understand the clinical aspects of FOP and then take those lessons from the clinic. We're not just seeing you in the clinic, but we're learning from you in the clinic, and we're taking those lessons and things that you tell us about the condition back to the laboratory and trying to dissect them uh, into a molecular, genetic, and uh, physiological level so that we can bring them back to you. From those, we've been able to draw the early maps. And one of the early maps we drew was uh, locating where the FOP gene was uh, on the second uh, chromosome, on the long arm of the second chromosome, but a fairly wide area. 
and uh, using those data from the multi-generational families that uh, many in the IFOPA have helped us to find, we have put that together with, um, uh, with a functional approach that we used, uh, assuming that, not assuming, but hypothesizing that the bone morphogenetic protein pathway would be involved. And putting those two things together, in uh, 2006, we discovered the gene for FOP. Uh, I, can't, uh, I can't overemphasize the importance of this discovery. This was a major discovery by us and our colleagues around the world. And w to our complete astonishment, we found that 97% of patients in the FOP community around the world, without having any affected parents, had a spontaneous new mutation in a gene called ACVR1, and it really only, only um, uh, was one letter change. You can see that here. Uh, this is the normal copy of the gene, uh, and at position uh, 617 in the, in the genetic letters, you see two peaks. One of the two copies of the gene has a genetic change, and that genetic change we showed eventually leads to FOP. I'll talk a little bit later about the uh, patients who have variability in that, uh, in that gene. But this was a, a major, major discovery uh, that uh, changed the entire FOP community. That gene encodes a protein. That protein is a switch. It's like a faucet or a tap, which you'll see, uh, that sends signals into particular cells that creates the new bone uh, that uh, crosses the joints, immobilizes the joints, and makes movement difficult or impossible. And you see here on the, on the diagram that one genetic letter in the uh, code changes one amino acid, one uh, building block in the protein that uh, opens this area here, and that causes all sorts of havoc that leads to the generation of, of new bone in FOP. This was published in, a, uh, in an article in 2006 in Nature Genetics that a recurrent mutation in this receptor causes uh, sporadic and inherited FOP, in other words, in those individuals who have no, uh, their parents are not involved, but also in the individuals where it was directly inherited from a parent to a child in the seven small multi-generational families. And the following week, the journal Science published a paper, uh, an editorial that the bone disease gene was finally found. And basically, they were saying, um, what took you so long? But also, they were saying, it took an entire community. It takes a community to find this. And it took the entire FOP community working together to find these multi-generational families, the scientists around the world working with us to find the gene um, that uh, really changed the landscape of, this, uh, uh, of our trajectory and enabled us to reach this point and hopefully uh, a lot sooner and a lot further. A few weeks after the, uh, after the article was published, uh, the New York Times published an article, and I particularly like the title of this article. This was written by Mike Mason for the New York Times. He said, finally, finally, there's a sense of exasperation. Finally, with genetic discovery, hope for escape from a prison of bone. And this is Hayden Fife from Sausalito, California, from El Valley, rather, near San Francisco. And he said to me, Dr. Kaplan, uh, I can see Alcatraz from near my house, and I hope that, um, that the work, uh, the, the work can now help discover treatments that will help uh, prevent uh, and, and escape from this prison of bone like Alcatraz. Um, and that, that made a huge impression on me and a lot of other scientists around the world who began studying FOP. This chart is amazing. This chart shows on the, on the uh, x-axis here the years, 1990 to 2018, and this axis, the y-axis, shows the pharmaceutical company's <coughs> interest in FOP. <coughs> there was some pharmaceutical company interest, but very, very meager uh, prior to the gene discovery in 2006. And then you can see the slope of this curve just really exploded. It took off like a rocket. And, um, and I think there is a message there that we, finally we had a target, not just of a, of a, of, of a gene, but of a, an entire pathway uh, that could be targeted. And this gave a tremendous uh, hope to the FOP community. There are many, many scientists that were working on this pathway, but had no idea 
that uh, FOP was connected to it. And so they woke up the next morning, basically, and found that the oil had been discovered on their property. Um, and not for a personal basis, but in the sense that they could now work on this pathway uh, and hope to uh, translate their discoveries into a treatment. So this has been a remarkable discovery. And Eileen and I were just recently in Japan at a bone morphogenetic protein conference. And that group now has a major, major focus on FOP. And, uh, and we see this from around the world. This is extremely exciting to all of us, especially to me and Eileen, uh, when, when we labored for so many years uh, trying uh, against, against a, an onslaught of, of, of uh, people and uh, comments about why are you working on such a rare disease, you're never gonna find anything useful. Well, ho hopefully we did. Um, this, no, this, this, thank you, this chart, uh, basically shows, oops, sorry, that um, uh, the bullseye of the, the bullseye uh, for therapy is ACBR1, the gene that uh, and the protein encoded by it that causes FOP. But over the years, we and our colleagues around the world have discovered, and that's where the ongoing research is, not just to discover the gene, but to discover this pathway now how soft tissue injuries, spontaneous flare-ups, inflammation. There's been tremendous work. Just published uh, yesterday was a paper from Ed Chow in San Francisco about the role of inflammatory cells in FOP. Uh, Eileen and her students published a paper earlier this year showing that the mast cells and the macrophages play a very important role in triggering this process. And we showed uh, uh, t it several years ago that low oxygen tension plays a role in perhaps triggering the bone morphogenetic protein and activin A that we'll talk about a little bit later, the hormone-like molecules that trigger the uh, very sensitive, uh, oversensitive uh, uh, switch that leads to the heterotopic bone formation. And on this side of the chart here, we have potential treatments for FOP. The red arrows uh, and the blunt ends indicate ways that we can block this process. So um, we're learning much more, not just about the gene, but about the process of forming bone in, in FOP. There are four targets for inhibiting FOP, basically blocking the signaling pathways, the ACVR1 signaling pathways, uh, inhibiting the progenitor cells, I'm gonna talk more about that later, suppressing the triggers, the matches that light the fire, the sticks that, 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 that wake up that grizzly bear, and ways to modify the tissue microenvironment so we don't amplify this uh, signal. And all of these are very, very important and currently being investigated and hopefully will be brought back as eventual treatments for FOP. Now, after the discovery of the gene for FOP, the question is, okay, that's, uh, that looks like a genetic uh, mutation uh, and everybody who has FOP has it and nobody who doesn't have FOP has it. Um, but does that really cause FOP? So the first, uh, um, the first set of experiments were done by Eileen and uh, one of her uh, graduate students, where they took the FOP gene mutation, introduced it into a mouse, and uh, the first thing they noticed was the uh, mice toes were, were shorter. These are the normal toes, and these are the mouse toes. Well, that was a, a, a step in the right direction. They also found that these mice developed uh, a lot of joint problems that FOP patients have. In the neck, for example, the, the cervical spine began to fuse. Um, many of the patients have told us that the children don't crawl. Well, you can't crawl if you can't uh, hold your neck up straight, and you can't hold your neck up straight if, uh, if these joints don't form properly. This has nothing to do with heterotopic bone. This is the way the joints form. We all know about the big toe, but there are other small joints in the body that are also affected. Uh, the joints where the ribs join the spine, that is very uh, important in the formation of, of scoliosis in some children, even in the absence of forming uh, extra bone. And these osteochondroma-like uh, lesions around the joints that we notice around the tibia, but also occur around the shoulder blades, the jaw, and all, many, other, many other areas of the body uh, are also attributed uh, to the embryonic effects of FOB. So th this was the first animal model, and I, we found that, that when these animals were injected uh, with, uh, with, within, with, with something that injures the muscle, they form bone according to the same way that we found 
uh, that uh, children with FOP form bone, and you have all helped in that discovery because you have sent us the tissues from un uh, the unfortunate biopsies that many of you and your predecessors have had before the proper diagnosis of FOP, and we've learned about the pathology of FOP, and we learned in these animals that they're the same. Well, since then, uh, Regeneron uh, and other uh, uh, other laboratories around the world have made modified uh, models of this uh, animal model that have been very useful in drug discovery. And this now allows us to have colonies of mice that are similar. I mean, mice are not people, people are not mice, but it gives us some idea of whether some drugs may work. And those, uh, those experiments and those, um, uh, those experiments in animals have enlightened the pathway that enables us to bring drugs to clinical trials that you've heard about and you'll hear more about. Well, the, as I said, the ACVR1 protein uh, is, uh, is encoded by the gene, and this sits on the cell membrane, and this speaks to many other uh, receptors in the antennas-like, mo faucet-like molecules uh, in the membrane. Uh, these are acted on by hormone-like molecules that then transmit their signals. And we found that after the discovery of the gene, and even before the discovery of the gene, that this pathway was abnormal, that, there was this, that the mutation didn't cause this receptor to constantly send an overactive signal at a high amplitude, but it sent a signal at a low amplitude, sort of like a leaky faucet. And then something uh, triggered that faucet, and these hormone-like molecules seem to trigger that faucet. So the faucet exploded with activity, and the intermediate molecules in this pathway, called SMADs, uh, are, the, are the signal that, uh, that tells the cells to transform into, uh, into bone. Now, imagine, uh, imagine as a metaphor, imagine that there's an ACVR1 factory, and if you don't have FOP, that factory, uh, has two copies of the gene, a copy from your mother and father, and makes a normal ACVR1. But imagine that in FOP, that factory uh, makes one normal copy, but one copy is damaged. It's damaged by the gene mutation. So one of the copies of the faucet, half the faucets are ab abnormal in a sense, they're damaged because they have that genetic change that leads to the abnormality of the faucet. And that abnormality, normally, that faucet should, or the receptor, the faucet is the metaphor for the receptor, that faucet should be off. You don't want to make bone, you don't want to repair your muscle, that faucet should be off. That faucet should be off, and normally the bone morphogenetic proteins turn that faucet on, and the water comes out, that's a signal in a, as a metaphor for the SMAD proteins that signal the body to either repair the muscle, um, et, et cetera. But in FOP, that faucet is drippy. That faucet is drippy, and it drips, drips, drips. And when the bone morphogenetic proteins turn that faucet on, it sort of explodes with activity. Sort of like this. It's like a drippy faucet, a drippy faucet. And when you turn the faucet on, instead of the water coming out, it sort of explodes with activity. Now, we currently think, this is our hypothesis, that all of the joint malformations that we see in FOP, the neck, the thumb, the toe, where the ribs join the spine that prevents chest expansion that may lead, if it's asymmetric, to the scoliosis, partly. The abnormalities in the hip joint that have nothing to do with extra bone, but are, th uh, you know, the way the hip joint doesn't form normally, and many other joints in the body, including these osteochondromas that form near the joints, we believe that's due to the drippy faucet during embryonic life, before you're born. And then after you're born, a hormone-like molecules turn this faucet on, explode with activity, probably work on different cells, and cause the body to form all this extra bone that is so troubling. Now, uh, several years ago, a group of scientists at Regeneron, a pharmaceuticals company, and scientists at, in Japan, uh, independently found that there was another molecule, another hormone-like molecule that seemed to turn on that switch, or it seemed to affect that switch, I should say. And that molecule was called active in A. And in the normal, <coughs> in the, oh, sorry. 
In the normal uh, uh, faucet or ACVR1, it, again, it should be off. Bone morphogenic proteins turn it on. But the scientists from Regeneron and in Japan found that the faucet normally should be off, but there's another molecule called active in A, and it acts to turn the normal faucet off, where the bone morphogenetic proteins act to turn that faucet on. They also found that the, um, again, this is uh, the FOP faucet, as we originally thought, the bone morphogenic proteins turn it on, but unlike in the normal faucet, where the active in A acts to turn the faucet off, it acts in the same direction as the BMPs, as the bone morphogenic proteins, to turn the faucet on, and it explodes, absolutely explodes with activity. And the scientists from Regeneron and the uh, Japanese group found that when they used an antibody to active in A, it seemed to turn that faucet off, and using the animal models, the newer animal models, the 2.0 animal models, they found that that antibody turned the faucet off and that there was less bone formed. And that basically, you'll hear more about it from Scott later on, but that basically is the basis for the uh, active in A antibody trial that's currently, uh, that's cu currently ongoing right now. So that's very exciting. And you all see in this that this all has to do with the, with, with the ACVR1, some upstream, some downstream, as we'll get to in a moment. Well, here we are. So we've known for many years that in FOP, the FOP gene doesn't turn a muscle directly into a bone. There's an injury phase, there's an inflammation phase, and then some progenitor cells, which I'll talk about later, uh, are, are stimulated. And from those cells, there's a tremendous reaction. Those cells proliferate. They turn into cartilage, which is an intermediary in the formation of bone, sort of a scaffold. And on that scaffold, the bone is built. And we knew this for many, many years. Then Maurizio Pasifici, who is at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia uh, and has been this, uh, studying this pathway in other contexts for many years, found that the retinoic acid receptor gamma agonist, that's a mouthful, basically drugs like paloverotene inhibit this part of the pathway. They don't stop the flare-up necessarily. They don't stop this part of the pathway. Maybe they affect it in some way, but they are very potent in stopping the scaffold from being built. Well, if you can't build a scaffold, you can't build a skyscraper. And that is the basis for the paloverotene uh, trials that you'll hear about or that you've been participating in. Again, <clears throat> it may have an effect on, on this part, but for the most part, the paloverotene doesn't affect the flare-ups as much as it affects the downstream formation of bone. And again, the water coming out of the faucet is like the signal, uh, in increased signal from this FOP uh, switch, from this ACVR1 receptor to form more bone. And in a sense, the way I look at it, others may not look at it this way, but I look at it like paloverotene as an umbrella that helps you from becoming wet, from, uh, helps this prevent this signal from getting transmitted to form bone. Now, we all know that we carry umbrellas on rainy days, and uh, paloverotene is like an umbrella. In this, in this process. So I've used the grizzly bear analogy <coughs> before, but here I'm going to use the faucet analogy. We know that the <coughs> FOP mutation doesn't turn a normal faucet into an exploding faucet. It turns a normal faucet into a drippy faucet, and something makes that faucet explode. We know now that BMPs and activin are necessary, but something even upstream triggers that and, and amplifies that signal. And we found years ago that low oxygen and inflammation are two sides of the same coin, and they, uh, they certainly amplify this signal, and they amplify this signal tremendously through a process uh, inside the cell. And I'm not going to get into here, but th these are published data, and we know, as I mentioned before, from uh, studies that Eileen has done with her graduate students, and studies that are just published this week, very, very exciting, you probably haven't seen that yet, from Dr. Shao from San Francisco, that, the, that certain cells, inflammatory cells, uh, are responsible um, for, this, uh, for this switch. So that has, <clears throat> your observations in the clinic that these things either start spontaneously or viruses or trauma uh, trigger FOP, has led us to the under, led us 
to investigate the role of inflammation in triggering this process that hopefully will come back and lead to better treatments. <clears throat> Dr. Pignolo and I and our colleagues have found that certain drugs uh, block this inflammatory pathway, uh, and one of them is imatinib. It works through many different uh, uh, targets, inflammatory targets in the pathway. Some, of, some patients have been on imatinib uh, and have had uh, uh, improvement in the flare-up status that hopefully will, um, will be uh, translated into clinical studies, controlled, placebo-tried, uh, placebo-controlled clinical studies that will hopefully introduce in the next year uh, in the FOP community for youngsters, not as an ultimate treatment, but as a stopgap measure so, uh, so that we can have the luxury of having some of these newer, more specific compounds become available to the younger patients. So again, this is a very exciting area uh, of research and, uh, and ongoing discovery. And uh, so, as I showed before, the FOP gene here, the mutation doesn't turn a, uh, a normal faucet into exploding faucet, it turns a normal faucet into a leaky faucet, and inflammation and epoxia through this inflammation pathway, it caused this path to explode and probably help turn on the BMPs and the active NA and amplify that response once it has started. So again, I showed this, this diagram before. Uh, we think that the leaky faucet in FOP is responsible for some of these prenatal conditions. We, we're not absolutely sure yet, but we think so. And we think that the devil here uh, that stimulates the that is inflammation stimulates this uh, pathway and le that leads to heterotopic bone. And this has led uh, uh, to current investigations in the laboratory that HIF1 alpha inhibitors that block the uh, hypoxic response in those cells, the mTOR inhibitors, I won't get into those pathways, but currently being uh, uh, studied by the Japanese investigators with rapamycin the anti-inflammatory drugs, the immune suppressants. Again, sort of like this uh, uh, action hero that's punching the, uh, the devil here and, um, and, 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 and activating the devil and, and uh, uh, so that the devil doesn't activate this, this switch. Now, very exciting, it's not, it, there's not so much of it in this annual report, it'll be in the next annual report that we'll begin writing in a, in a few months. But one of the very exciting discoveries in the last year has been that multipotent progenitor cells that live in the skeletal muscle uh, tissue, not muscle cells, but that live in the muscle tissue, exhibit robust BMP and activin A dependent a bone formation activity and lead to bone uh, uh, extra heterotopic ossification. So this diagram is a picture of the muscles, the bundles in the muscles, which are in red or pink, and these show the blood vessels in the muscle tissue. And these are just schematic uh, diagrams that show the satellite cells that participate in that process. But these little blue cells here are called FAP cells. FAPs, again, MAPs, TAPs, talked about the TAPs, and now FAPs. FAP cells are fibroadipogenic progenitor cells. Big words, uh, fibrous tissue is connective tissue. Adipogenic means coming from fat tissue inside the muscle or that lead to fat uh, tissue development inside the muscle. These are supporting cells in muscle repair normally, and they've been identified, I won't go through all the scientific details, but they've been identified as major precursors of heterotopic or extraskeletal bone formation in, in FOP and even non-FOP-like heterotopic bone formation that occurs after muscle injuries, uh, blast injuries, head injuries, et cetera, that occur in the uh, civilian and military population as well. These cells have certain signatures, certain identification tags, like the ones you're wearing around your neck that exist on the cell membrane that enable us to identify these cells and Dr. Goldhamer and his group, especially from Connecticut, they, Dr. Goldhamer is at Penn, got inspired by FOP from the Cali Grants, the um, Ian Cali Grants many years ago, and has taken that work now to another level and has shown that these particular cells uh, that have identification of 
a blood, cell mar uh, blood vessel markers, but are not blood, ves blood, blood vessel cells. These are completely different cells. But they share some of those markers. They contribute to extra bone formation in FOP. Now imagine here in this schematic diagram, this is a house that has many, many rooms. It's sort of like our body is made up of cells, many different types of cells, liver cells, brain cells, kidney cells, et cetera. These fibroadipogenic cells, imagine that they're, in the, the, they're like this cell here in this house. These cells are the cells or among the cells that proliferate and form the extra bone in FOP. Well, let's take a look at those cells in a little bit more detail. Well, in those cells, imagine that in the, these cells that form bone, there's, three, there's four different taps. There's the tap or faucet, the AC very on switch that's on the sink. There's the faucet on the toilet. There's the faucet in the shower, and there's the faucet in the bathtub. This is ALK2 or ACVR1, also known as ALK2. ALK3 is in the toilet. ALK6 is in the shower. ALK1 is in the bathtub. Well, we want a, we want a drug that just affects ALK2. We don't want to turn off the toilet, the shower, and the bathtub. We just want to turn off the sink uh, because that's the, the switch in the cell that, that triggers this, uh, this explosion of water that causes this cell to become abnormal, and that leads to the extra bone formation. Now, uh, scientists at, at Harvard, Dr. Yu and Dr. Block, uh, uh, um, studied a protein, a, a molecule called dorsomorphin, a small molecule called dorsomorphin. Dorsomorphin was discovered by Dr. Chaz Hong, who's now, who's at Vanderbilt, who's now uh, in Baltimore at, uh, at the University of Maryland. And he discovered this classic molecule. Why, how did he discover it? He was inspired by the article in the New York Times. And he had been investigating these molecules to try to uh, be able to uh, uh, stop this molecule so he could, uh, this molecule is involved in heart disease as well uh, when it's inactive. And he said, gee, I'm trying to make a model in animals to inactivate this gene. I didn't know that if I inactivate this gene, and this may be part of a therapy for a disease called FOB. I never heard about it until I read the article in the New York Times. So um, he he and uh, Dr. Yu and Dr. Block studied this molecule. They found that this molecule inhibited the, the sink, the toilet, the shower, the, the, um, uh, and the bathtub. And uh, when this molecule, uh, the, green, the green is the diagram, green is the three-dimensional molecule of ACVR1. This is the active part of that switch. This is the, the handle on the faucet. And when the dorsomorphin fits in the faucet, it blocks the faucet and turns the faucet off. Well, it also, as I said, turns off the toilet, not, not just the sink, but the toilet, the shower, and the, and the bathtub. Um, and so we, we really can't use that. But this has stimulated the pharmaceutical companies and uh, various universities around the world to find something that just inactivates the switch or the ACVR1 faucet. And and that is very, very exciting. You'll be hearing later this morning from uh, Andy Gardner from Blueprint about molecules that will come out uh, and hopefully enter clinical trials very soon. These molecules uh, just fit into the, uh, in, in, just turn off this, hopefully, the switch um, in the sink. And they're like stoppers that fit into the faucet and stop that. So this is very, very exciting. And these molecules, hopefully, uh, will be introduced uh, into clinical trials uh, in the in the next uh, in the next uh, year or so. Again, there's six companies now that are interested in this approach, and six companies around the world working on various uh, drugs that will block just this faucet and not the other faucets in these fibroadipogenic progenitor cells. Um, well, the question is, this is great for classic FOP. Will some of these approaches work for a variant FOP, and what is variant FOP? Well, just briefly, when, <clears throat> when we started seeing patients with FOP, we started seeing you, and some of the folks who are in this room, years ago, bef way before the gene was discovered, we recognized that some of the features were like FOP, like the extra bone formation, but some, was, some were more severe, some were less severe, um, and we also noticed that in some patients, the toes looked relatively normal, where in other patients, the toes looked even more different 
and abnormal, then, then we see uh, usually an FOP, like they're missing toes, like they're missing uh, the big toe, or they're missing uh, thumbs, et cetera. And so we called these variants at that time, clinical variants, and we said, you know, eventually when the gene is discovered, uh, we'll go back and we'll see whether you have some variation in that, maybe it's some other gene, and to uh, Eileen's and my and Bob's and other colleagues' surprise, it was shocking that every patient who we clinically described as having an FOP variant or variant FOP based on the, basically the thumbs and the toes, the hands and the, and the feet, also had a different mutation in the ACVR1 gene. And so by measuring the toe, as Victor Hugo said, we estimate the giant. And, um, and we found, basically, and others have contributed to this beautifully in, in, the, uh, in, the, up, in the ensuing years, that 97, approximately 95, 97% of patients around the world have the R206 mutation that I showed you, that, uh, that's the, what we call the classic mutation. But about 3% have other mutations in that gene. Those mutations are also in other parts of the same faucet, not the ACVR3 or ACR1 or ACVR6, but ACVR2. And nobody, and everybody who has some form of FOP has some mutation in that gene and somewhere in that faucet. And we think that uh, drugs, many drugs, not all, but many of the approaches that are currently being used for the, uh, uh, for the classic form of FOP will also be applicable to the variant forms of FOP, some of them that are more mild and some that are more severe, which we call the variants. And, you, uh, and you, uh, there's something on the F IFOPA website about variants, and Eileen and I wrote a very long discussion that we'll incorporate into next year's annual report about the variants, so you can read about that more. What I've shown on this slide here is uh, all the approaches. Uh, one approach is to block the active NA, blocking BMPs, maybe blocking both. Um, and uh, there's an approach in Japan to block, the, uh, to block the receptor itself, antibodies against the receptor. Uh, the signal transduction inhibitor approach, uh, basically finding the, the molecule that's both safe and effective in shutting off the uh, faucet in the sink in the FAP cells and not uh, the bathtub, uh, bathtubs, uh, showers, and and toilets around the house, just in this sink. Uh, maybe some of these inflammatory triggers uh, will be important, and inhibitors will be specific and safe enough to use to inhibit the amplification of this process that we know is, is stimulated or is, is under the control of this faucet. So maybe the imatinib-like drugs, the mTOR inhibitors, the anti-inflammatories, if they become specific enough, and the immunosuppressants, and again, paliveratine as a great umbrella to protect against this signal from reaching those FAP cells and triggering that new bone formation. Um, we're constantly, this is a cover of The New Yorker from a few months ago, or from earlier this year, I should say, and basically the scientists are working under the thing to figure out new approaches uh, as we go along. Uh, maybe there's an approach, a genetic approach. Maybe in the ACVR1 factory, we can inhibit, uh, this is not for the next few years, maybe in an animal model, but not for patients in the next few years, maybe using inhibitory RNA or what is the CRISPR approach that you've seen on, on television on 60 Minutes. Maybe we can use that approach to inhibit uh, or to block the factory from producing the abnormal faucets. We're still many years away from this clinically, but we're still working on that um, in, in the laboratory. And these may become ultimate treatments down the line for a condition for FOP. So I've shown this to you before. Now, I hope I've shown you that the ACVR1 gene is the center of the bullseye. It stimulated all the activity and the explosion of activity around the world that's led to the dramatic pharmaceutical company interest in this condition uh, and upstream and downstream approaches which are currently being investigated by scientists around the world. And people always ask me, um, well, is this drug, is this approach better than that approach? You know, personally, I'll give you my own opinion, but this is just my own opinion. My own opinion is that eventually FOP will hopefully be no different from hypertension or 
or asthma or diabetes where the doctors, the clinicians, have in their doctor's bag many different drugs that block many different parts of this process. We all know that these that we want drugs that stop the flare-ups, that prevent the flare-ups, that maintain function, uh, and some of that ma maintenance of function may come from that, those joints, uh, the wearing out of those joints that are patterned in the embryo from the drippy faucet, uh, slow joint degeneration, again, from, from those degenerative joints. So many of you rep have reported that the FOP progresses in the absence of flare-ups. We don't know whether that's from joint abnormalities that are getting worse from extra bone or maybe from both. So we want all of that, and we want to change the natural history of the disease. We also recognize, especially from what I've learned from my colleagues in the pharmaceutical industry, that no drug uh, is, is perfect. I mean, even a glass of water, we can choke on a glass of water. Um, so you know, every drug has side effects. There are off-target effects. Uh, certain people have allergies to drugs. Uh, some people respond to drugs, other people don't. You know, that's just the genetic variability in our FOP community around the world. We're different than the mice that are inbred strains that have the same genetics. They're basically clones. We're not clones. And we may have allergies and non-responsiveness to certain medications. Uh, maybe we'll get sick. Maybe patients will get sick from a stomach virus, and they'll throw up the medicine, and they'll be off the medicine for a week, and they'll need to be on another medicine in the interim. Uh, maybe some of these medicines, you know, using them for months and years and decades, maybe there'll be resistance developed over time. I don't know. Um, but we need multiple medicines. There are compliance issues. There are tolerability issues. There are access to medications. And of course, there's a, of course, there's the cost issue. So, so I think personally that many approaches are very important for FOP. We need to design clinical trials that test many of these different approaches and hopefully, you know, five years, ten years from now, instead of having just drugs that uh, help the symptoms of FOP, we'll have drugs that can stop the process of FOP that is directly related to what we've learned in the laboratory uh, from this work. And so I'm almost done. This is a, uh, a letter that I received many years ago. Some of you have seen this before. It says, Dr. Well, it says, uh, thank you for seeing me in the hospital. I had fun on the tour. I like the ice cream. We went to the cafeteria to get some ice cream. I didn't like the needle, nettle. Uh, hope to see you again. Please help fix my FOP. This is from Adam Bigris, who's now an adult who lives in Canada. This is when he was a little boy. So I'm hoping that we're, we'll be able to do this. And again, my final, my final words today are those of hope. Finally, with genetic discovery, hope for hope for escape from a prison of bone. And Ian Callie said many years ago, he said to me, Dr. Kaplan, with a genetic discovery, we went from hopeless to hopeful. And Yael Camboa, who is a medical student in Mexico, said, Fred, we need hope, and if we have hope, we'll be OK. Uh, this is our team in Philadelphia. Uh, the stuff I've talked to you about this morning is not done by me. I hardly go to the laboratory. I'm there. I wander around. I see what these great scientists are doing. I have some ideas. Uh, these are the scientists currently working in the lab and part of our clinical team as well. But this, these teams now are reproduced throughout the world at universities, at companies, at corporations, and we all want to use what we're learning to bring back to you, the patients, the product of these learnings so that we can treat and eventually cure FOP. There's one team and one mission, and that's not just at Penn, that's the entire FOP community around the world. These are. Uh, uh, people that contributed to FOP papers uh, just from Penn around the world. It's 10 times this. And uh, now you have the 27th report. This is the 25th report. Um, and i just like to acknowledge the many funding sources for this work. I particularly want to acknowledge uh, the Cali family and um, Diane Weiss, who's here today, uh, who sponsored the professorship I have at Penn that uh, allows me, allowed me over the past 20 years to do this work uh, and to be part of this uh, work. And, and Diane uh, has been a champion of this community for years and years and years uh, during the time when, when we were really struggling, when we were really struggling to get the attention of the world and the attention of scientists and doctors around the world to study FOP. We're in a different era now. We're moving forward. 
Thank you.